Like and subscribe to the channel, and for early access, become a Road to Tar Valen YouTube member. Hello and welcome back to the channel. Today we are talking about Dune Part 2 and I am joined once again by friend of the channel, Jason Denzel. It is so good to have you. The main, the main reason I wanted to ask you on to cover this with me is because you're not only a Dune fan, but you are an author. You've written three fantasy novels and then some and I think many people know you from being the founder of Dragon Mount, which you ran for decades. <laughs> so thank you so much. Amber, thanks so much for having me back. I, I'm so delighted to be back here. I am uh, the past year or so since my last book, I've been heads down working on this new project. And I told myself like, okay, I'm not going to do any podcast this year. I'm not going to, I'm going to just mostly, I'm going to stay huddled in my little cave typing on a typewriter and trying to struggle through a book. But when you approached me about talking about Dune, which might be one of, it's, you know, my top two, three novels of all time. I read it in high school for the first time. Like many of the people, maybe like you, maybe like a lot of the people, you know, listening to this, you know, have, have been lifelong fans. And so I, I, I just couldn't resist. I, I'm so glad to be here. I've been a big fan of the the franchise and all the various movie adaptations over there. So but I'm so excited for this. Thanks I, for having me on. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so excited. This I feel like this movie, it, it's been a while since I've been in a theater. So I don't, I have to drive about an hour away to get to a theater here in Germany that will actually offer movies in their original language. So like, it's a big thing for me to go to a movie theater and be like committing to this. And yeah. Dune was like, that was a reason. That was a choice. It really feels like this is one of those movies that demands to be seen on a big screen. I know that's, you know, that's what the studios say because they want your extra dollars. And that's what the filmmakers say, you know, because they understand uh, I've got a big TV at home that I got during the pandemic. <laughs> yeah. you know, we were stuck at home and everything. So I've got this like big TV or whatever. And I'm like, I really need to see Dune on like a IMAX screen. And so... You know, I don't get out to the movie theater a lot either, but I made the point, you know, my son and I went out and we saw it um, in IMAX. And then I went again last night in anticipation of this podcast. So I've seen it twice now okay. and I'm, uh, I'm ready for this. Okay. So you've seen it twice. Okay. I feel like that's a, a strong indication of how you felt about the movie. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh -huh. The first thing that I wanted to ask you is, how impactful do you think that this film will be for science fiction television and film? And this, I, I do want to point out, this won't be any spoilery talk. When we do get to spoilers, I'll let our listeners know, but this is more about the impact of this film on science fiction. You know, no one has a crystal ball, right? But to me, this feels, th this movie, and really, it, when I say this movie, I really I'm including Dune Part One and Dune Part Two, and um, and potentially they're talking about a Dune Part Three, and I'm sure we'll touch on that a little bit later. But in general, this adaptation, adapted by you know Vill Villeneuve, Villeneuve, yeah, Villeneuve, yeah um, and his team, feels different. It feels like a milestone in the sense that, like we know, like if you. If you look at, you know, a, a 10,000 foot view of science fiction and fantasy, of the great sagas and tales that have been written first as novels over the, you know, uh, over the last century or so, where, you know, the big ones that come to mind are things like The Lord of the Rings and, um, and Dune is among them and maybe Harry Potter and, you know, like some of these big ones. And just as it took a couple adaptations for them to really nail the Lord of the Rings. And we finally got Peter Jackson's masterpiece that has stood yeah. the test of time 20 some odd years later. I, I, if you sit down and watch the Lord of the Rings, I mean, the, those notes of the music and, you know, Howard Short scored it and, and you're there and it's like, nothing's changed. It, it feels just like it did 20 years ago, at least for me. And it, feels fresh and my kids who are in their late teens you know they watch it and it doesn't feel like an old movie to them you know yeah and I think this Dune movie will be the same thing I feel like we've had two previous adaptations you know a big budget thing and then a low budget thing and we can kind of talk about those but those had their pros and cons and I feel like 
this adaptation, these two movies feel, feel timeless in their own way. Like in 20 years, you, you, I mean, the effects are amazing, but beyond visually, like it just, it's, it feels like this was a, not just an accurate or mostly accurate adaptation, but it also feels like a heartfelt adaptation that really understood the material. The things that they changed were changed in a good way, I think. And so I think this is going to stand the test of time, you know, these movies here. And, um, and you can really tell, like, I think we can all tell when you go to a movie and the adaptation, you watch it, you can really tell when a filmmaker genuinely gets the material. They can care about it, of course, they usually care. Sometimes, though, they just kind of miss, a, like, uh, you miss the main point or whatever. I think yeah. that they nail nailed the main thing so i think this is going to be something that sticks around for a while i mean what what do you think do you get that sense too so i i firmly told myself i was not going to walk into this episode right now and just trying to like sell the hype on it you know what i mean like i, <laughs> yeah. I don't want and to I mean, right but it when I left the movie theater I was just like you know like my heart was just kind of like wow like that that was just something different it was so unapologetic like it was just the visuals the sound i mean like those deep vibrations and everything like you really feel it when i when i left i was like okay i have to really like get my phone out and write stuff down real quick because of course like i want it all to stay fresh and i want my thoughts like right then and there and as i've sat on that a little bit longer like i've been reflecting on how right now in especially in television i want to say like apple tv as an example like i feel like there's been this big wave of science fiction being kind of propelled forward in a way that we haven't seen in a while because they're really doing like all of these adaptations like silo foundation i think the murderbot diaries just got greenlit and that's in the works as we speak i think they've already cast people for it and going back to like Dune, it almost makes me really hopeful. Like, are we going to see this kind of science fiction renaissance on our hands, which would be absolutely wonderful. And also, is this going to be the science fiction movie where anytime there's a big adaptation that people are pointing to saying like, is this going to be the next Dune? And I don't say that lightly. I'm not trying to be hyperbolic or just you know, like running on the hype or whatever, I did really think that it was just that fantastic of a film and a really interesting adaptation as well. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I, I think you nailed it right in the head. And there, um, there's something to be said for all of the, I mean, that, that hype comes from somewhere. And yeah, you know, it's often, you know, we can celebrate the box office numbers or whatever it is. I think, you know, they're already seeing that it's doing well. But aside from, you know, the dollar values that, that we put on these things, yeah. I mean, there's real buzz. I mean, you can, uh, just looking at my Facebook feed, my Facebook feed is fill, full of people, you know, <laughs> gushing about this thing without any negativity. And um, I think that this one will... Probably, like you said, you know, be something that, you know, the, the science, at least for the next couple of years, you know, every science fiction story, movie that comes out, they're going to equate it to the next Dune or, you know, whatever it is. So Right. I mean, yeah. the visuals, the score, I mean, the story mm -hmm. itself, everything really, it, it checks a box where it's like, yeah, they, they did it. The, the movie's about three hours long. And right around like the second hour, I was like, is this going to be too long? And I was really like wondering how I was going to feel once we got to the end. When I got to the final scene, I was like, oh, that final scene. I mean, I, I could have sat there another 10 minutes. It felt right. like a six course meal where the chef is like bringing you out something delicious. And it's like, here's another one. Here's another one. And you're like, oh, God, I'm so full. But it's like such an abundance. Of, when, like... When's dessert? <laughs> yeah, dessert. exactly. <laughs> but it was it was a really it was a really nice experience, especially for someone like me who doesn't often go to the theater or really feel motivated to, I guess. But this was a movie that actually motivated me to do so. And I did kind of like after leaving the theater, I was like, I probably won't have the opportunity 
to get, you know, to this town that's almost an hour away to watch it a second time. So that little part of me was like, oh, that's so sad. What if I never see this in the theater again? (laughs) So I feel like that says a lot. You just have to get like a big subwoofer for your house or something to feel though. Because you're right. I'm glad you called out the sound design. Like I, like, you know, most people like you don't, sound is that invisible thing or the music. I mean, you hear it, you notice it and appreciate it. But, you know, for the most part, like it's rare that like I will stop in the middle of a movie and be like, wow, this sounds amazing. Like yeah, I, I'm distracted by the high quality of the sound. They, I mean, I can't imagine this not winning all sorts of sound design Oscars when the time comes, whenever, you know, but because it played such a huge part in, in everything. I could definitely see myself sitting through both <laughs> movies at this point, like, right? right? Yeah. Front to back. Yeah. As long as you break up into 45 minute chunks, you know, that's, that's the trick, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I have a snack, bathroom break, all of that. <laughs> So I did want to kind of move into some of the spoiler type questions and topics. So if you haven't watched the movie, go watch it and then maybe come back. But the first thing that I wanted to ask was about the scenes that really like spoke to you, that really grabbed hold of you. Was there like at least one in particular that you can point to? This was hard. <laughs> I felt like this, this was, was really hard. hard. I- I, I don't know if I can narrow it down to, mm-hmm. to one, but when Paul first rides, you know, summons the big sandworm, that was really, that was something else entirely. But I'm going to jump right to the, to the end in the climactic scene where he's facing down, you know, he's come face to face with the emperor and everyone kneels before Paul because he's the new emperor now and everything. And it's only, the only people standing are himself and Arulian, who's the uh, the princess that he's about to marry. And Chani, and it's really interesting because this was one of the the biggest one of the biggest changes that they made in the, from the book was that I don't know Amber have, have you read the Dune book? Have you, okay, yeah, so yeah. you know, so yeah, so one of the biggest changes that they made was Chani and her story and her arc and her personality, and in the book she largely stands behind Paul. She is she doesn't like it, but she's you know pro Paul. He's my guy. I stand with him. I believe in him. I will take this title of concubine, you know, and, uh, or whatever that means. I will have his heart, if not his, uh, you know, his, be his wife or whatever. And, uh, and I've always loved that the book, like the final sentence of the book is Jessica, his mother, saying to Chani that all these people here, like they will see us as concubines, but history will remember us as wives. And I always loved that this grand sweeping political saga and religious thing ended mm-hmm. on a very personal note. And they kept that in the movie, but in a very different way. And they kept it, the way, what they kept was this very personal thing, very personal relationship-based moment that had to do with that. But it was Chani saying, nope, like this is not for me. And I drew this line in the sand. See what I did there? Um, <laughs> you know, there was this line <laughs> in the sand that I drew. and. I didn't, I didn't anticipate that. Like, again, coming from the book and all these adaptations, I expected it to end like it ends in the book, right? And so when she says to him things like, you will always have me, Paul. I will always be by your side as long as you don't change or whatever. And I was like, no, 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 don't think much about it because I know like, oh yeah, she's a senpai. And he changes because he takes the water of life and I mean, everything changes when he does. And that right. he kind of knew that it was going to have to. And I love that she honors that. And she doesn't. And like, she's like, nope. You know, at least for now, I'm out, you know, and it ends with her riding the sandworm. It's her. And like the final shot we have is a close up of Chani. And I love that. It's not about Paul in this regard. It's not about, you know, all the armies flying off into space to have a big jihad. So that's right. I think my favorite scene ultimately was that final scene, that that final yeah. moment. That was that's a really good choice. I I loved. I mean, the end of the movie is so good. It has everything, specifically what you're talking about. But that kind of personal moment after you get this very adrenaline filled fight scene, which was just. I mean, that was probably my choice. Like just everything going on the the nukes, the um the sandworms the fight with Fade Ratha, and then everything that follows that kind of brings focus in on what does this mean, not just for Paul, but for the fate 
of everyone else and Chani being a big part of that. And I do really like that it feels like she's got a lot of agency right now. Yes. And I think like that's, you know, in, in our year of 2024, like it, it doesn't always seem realistic if a woman is just going to be like, ah, yes, I will sit by and, you know. Like, yeah, whatever whatever you want, Paul, the starry yeah. eyes. Yeah. And, <laughs> exactly. And she wasn't quite like that in the book from what I recall. It's been a couple of years since I reread it. The book was written in 1965. And I think we can get <clears throat> spoilers. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, well, what I'm getting at is that, you know, it was a different era then. Like he yeah. published in 1965 probably wrote it in the, you know, the, in the early 60s. So, you know, there were different, it was a different era, as we all know, back then or whatever. And not to say anything negative about Frank Herbert. Yes, there were different attitudes, in, societal attitudes, especially in the United States, where he was writing this book at, at the time, in, in those times. I do love how they gave Chani more agency. She needed that. And, um, and I think that it's a better change. And I think that an not only does it let um, you know Zendaya, who is an amazing actress, have a moment. Other than, I mean, can you imagine having someone of Zendaya's caliber and popularity and talent and everything, and just having her kind of shuffle off to the side and be like, "Yay, Paul, go boyfriend," you know, yeah, <laughs> you know, or whatever. And but I think she portrayed and delivered, you know, um, on a. It was a mixture of you know a script that gave her an opportunity to have. Um, to, you know, to give her this um, chance and then also her portrayal of it which clearly elevated her. you get the sense like she does love Paul and she wants to stand by his side she does stand by his side while everyone is you know saying like you know, Paul go south you know go do the go do the religious thing Madi you know and he's like no I can't I can't and he turns to Chani at one point and says you know why I can't and she stands by him she's like yep I get it I I mean and I support you, you know, and everything. And then, and uh, he needs her equally. Like it, he only really goes once he kind of has her approval and understanding of that, you know, that um, for that. So I think that with Chani and her agency, these are such a positive improvement that the great example of an adaptation that has rolled a little bit with the times and it's a positive change i think that if frank herbert were alive today i suspect that he'd probably go oh yeah that's a great idea <laughs> you know yeah. and she's a far more interesting character yeah i would agree i would agree and also it really it plays up like it does in the book how you how you talked about lady jessica and chani at the end of the book it also gives this kind of like split focus on two women being tasked with like very hard things right but also like very different personalities and archetypes but there's also just this like moment of like bringing focus in on two women that's kind of nice mm -hmm. specifically in a book that or in a tele or in a television show in a movie where if you're not familiar really familiar with the source material you might think this is the paul show you know yeah. like mm -hmm. and it's it it could be interpreted that way, but I don't think that that's the story. I think it's more about, you know, prophecy and manipulation and things, <laughs> things. Unfolding. Sounds really familiar. <laughs> like I can think of another big book series that has that same guy. You think it's about the boys, but really. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. I don't remember what that, that book series is, you know? Exactly. Maybe some of your listeners can can write in and remind right? us or, you know, something. <laughs> well, I I mean, we talked about the end of the movie, this big fight scene, and since you did kind of bring it up in a way, one of the <laughs> things that I really really loved about this fight sequence, especially at the end, is that the Fremen aren't superheroes. They are warriors, they are talented, but they're not doing these action sequences. Like it's a Marvel movie where it's like someone throws a punch and then, you know, like it, like these choppy, like very, mm -hmm. and this is no disrespect to Marvel, but it feels a bit more serious and authentic and not as glib and just more realistic in a way that we are showing these people as humans, not like these superhuman 
superheroes, if that makes sense. Yeah, and you get the sense that they, the way that they fight, it's chaotic. They feel like, I mean, if they're religious fanatics who are, um, you know, uh, I think in the book they're even like drugged up on spice sometimes. Like, you know, they're <laughs> like, like, you know, they're, uh, again, I'm, I'm a little vague on that specific detail, but I have read it recently. But yeah, in the book, they, they fight with this fervent passion that, you know, you can see being associated with you know, a, a religious fanatic and everything. And it, it almost to the point where it's, it, it's uncomfortable. They're, they're so deadly. You know, they talk about the, the, the one woman um, who was Chani's friend and she eventually got captured and killed by Fade Rasfa, but in the movie, and, you know, he says, you know, you killed nine of my people or whatever. And it's like, yeah, I can see that. I mean, you know, she's a, you know, she's on her home ground and, you know, uh, you know, knows the land, knows how to fight in sand. And, you know, the people she's fighting against probably don't know how to fight in sand. And, you know, she's fired up and I can see that. And I like how that they portrayed it like that rather than, as you described, you know, um, uh, you know, a punch and send someone flying across, you know. Uh, yeah. The dinner room. Although that one shot where Chani shoots the one guy with the bazooka you know, flying us. that was pretty cool though that was incredible i'm not that was pretty, that was pretty i cool. love that i yeah. love that so i do want to talk a little bit about the characters and this question wasn't just like who was your favorite character but more like in line with who do you feel like really brought the drama who was that just like you couldn't look away character first of all top to bottom i'm trying like you like you said earlier amber i'm, I'm going to try not to gush here but all the performances <laughs> were just amazing and everything you know and uh but the one actor that stood out for me in every scene and you're asking what my favorite scenes were i like i can't point to one of them because i need to point to this guy's every scene that he's in is stilgar um stilgar is like he's so funny first of all like he's and that's not something i would have associated with stilgar in general or whatever i would never have guessed that stilgar would have that and they didn't make him the comic relief they didn't make him slapstick but they made him feel almost like he was like if anyone's gonna tell a, a dad joke in this movie it's gonna be stilgar he makes a, a bit of a dad joke with paul when right before he sends paul up to go um for to capture the worm you know he he says, you know, uh, you don't show off, you know, and, and mm -hmm. I won't. He goes, no, really, don't, you know. And uh, they, he makes little comments like that, and he has these moments, and uh, you can see how fervent he is and how dedicated he is as a religious person. And then, you know, you know at, at the end, when Paul gives his big speech to the you know, to all the gathered leaders and the clans, you know, in the deep south, and he, you know, long live the fighters and everything. You know, he's the first on his feet. Go, yeah, let's go. You know, yeah. I just thought that you know the actor um, Javier Bardem um, did a sublime job portraying this character, and it was he was fantastic. He had such a small role in the first movie, really only a scene or two, and it was unfortunate. And he was you know kind of stoic because that's you know how he is. You know he there was a scene where he comes before Duke Leto and their first meeting, and the, the spitting scene if you if you might remember. Yeah, yeah. And um, he uh, and you know so he just kind of plays this hard ass there's not much to him but it isn't this movie he really shines and so yeah i loved every scene he was in and i i just want like a still guard movie or something i don't know <laughs> <laughs> how about you like what what stood out for you who are some of those well i i also love Stilgar. i feel like the actor i mean you can just tell watching it that he was having the time of his life with that character like i felt like he just had such a great connection but I think in terms of like the drama, who was someone where it was just, I, I just couldn't look away every time that they were speaking or really involved in a scene was Lady Jessica. And I mean, Rebecca Ferguson, she can do anything, I guess, and it's always good. But just the, the intensity in her was just so dynamic. These moments where she's using the voice on people and like you get that almost like really deep hollow sound coming from this petite, you know, woman where it's just, oh, like there's something so unsettling about it. 
I really enjoyed all of these moments, specifically when she's drinking the water of life and she's having this like meeting, sitting face to face with the Benny Gesserit woman who she's swat, or I guess taking over the role from the Reverend Mother. Mm -hmm. And you know, and especially when they put her in these, like, in this headgear and the outfits, I'm just like, my goodness. <laughs> like, the face tattoo. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Like, it just, it as the movie goes on, there's so many levels of her. Like, that first scene where she's beating the brains out of somebody with a large rock, and you're just like, mm -hmm. wow, Whoa. wow. She's dynamic. While pregnant. Yeah. While pregnant. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and there, I I completely agree. She um, Jessica has maybe you could argue like even including Paul, which is a, a tall order. You can debate it, but I, I think that Jessica carries at least as much of a burden as Paul, if not more, throughout these two movies or throughout this book. I'll say she's got so much on her shoulders, and she's she's involved in so many worlds and everything, and it's so important and to see her arc. And she does kind of become, in some ways in this film, she's in some way takes on an antagonistic role, you know, because she kind of represents for a while like that darker side, that darker path that Paul must take. And so, you know, there's something kind of sinister about her. They call her an abomination. Yeah. Um, you know, she's having, you know, the creepy conversations with her, um, with her unborn daughter, which is another big thing to change. So it. unsettling, but it worked it really, so well. It really did. And um, oh yeah, so I, I, I think, I feel like we need to talk a little bit about Alia. Like if for anyone who's read the book, one of the big differences is that in the book, there's a gap between the first movie and the second movie. There's a time leap of three years. I, I understand the choice that they decided not to have Alia be born, that they kept Alia um, in the movie, but kept her in the womb, <laughs> yeah. which I think was, was a fair change. Um, but I do love that Paul has, when Paul takes the water of life, he has a vision of the future, presumably a future where he sees an ocean on Arrakis, and he sees his grown sister, Alia, there. And I love that. And I'm hoping that if they do a part three to kind of tell the story of Dune Messiah, to you know wrap up Paul's story, that they cast, that they, I'm guessing they would bring her back and have her play as Alia. Yeah. But, yeah. So. When it when it cut to Anya Taylor-Joy, I was like, oh, oh, okay. Oh, is that who it was? Okay. I didn't realize that. Was, I, I yeah. Didn't realize. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I was like, Very oh, cool. it's her. It's her. I had purposely kept away from like spoilers and teasers and stuff like that. Like I really walked in not knowing much except for the first initial trailer that was dropped, but that really surprised me. And I was like, oh, I hope they bring her back. <laughs> I will say too, um, Austin Butler as Fade Ratha mm -hmm. was just that was something. <laughs> everyone, that was something. Everyone, <laughs> everyone I went to the movie theater with the, the two times I saw it, I nudged them like, "Hey, that's the guy who played Elvis. That's the guy who played Elvis." And they're like, "What?" <laughs> I I saw this on um on this uh, very credible news source on um, the Stephen Colbert show. <laughs> uh, he um. <laughs> Uh, he interviewed um, Denny Villeneuve, and for all those scenes that were filmed on uh, Getty Prime, you know, the Harkonnen homeworld, they filmed it with an IR camera, an infrared camera, and it was a risk because, you know, once you film it that way, you're committed to no color. But I think just visually, it was so amazing that that whole gladiator fight and everything with the the harsh kind of black and white with minimal color and it was really really interesting that was it was really cool I guess that goes like right into the next topic which is the visuals but I mean when you're when you're thinking about this movie is that probably the main thing that stands out for you like in terms of a pretty shocking visual that was a very shocking that's a great way to describe it um visual the you know, and then when you see there's a there's a shot they have in there on Getty Prime where after Fade Rasva has won this battle and he's being sent off to Arrakis and everyone's chanting his name, you know, Fade Rasva, they're chanting, and you see this big you know military parade and it's kind of creepy and disturbing. You know, it's got like old you know 
um, you know, Nazi vibes and no absolutely, so, like, absolutely. Has, like, I wrote that in my notes. I was like, yeah. "This is exactly what that looks like." <laughs> yeah, very intentionally, of course. And but uh, you know, aside from that, I mean, this. Uh, I'm, yeah, I mean, I think we we could gush for a whole hour about how beautiful this movie is. I think everyone who's even seen the trailer knows like how beautiful this movie is and um you know the sandworms and the even just the the quieter moments. Um, um Paul and Chani sitting on a on a hill and Chani even says like you know Arrakis is so beautiful at sunrise and you know you see all the the wind sleeping through the dunes and little sparkles of of the spice yeah. and everything and yeah I feel like I need like posters all over my house or something with this you know right <laughs> right the the color palette of this mm -hmm. movie is insane it is beautiful i think for me that opening scene just really i think kicked things off for me visually where yeah. the sun is kind of like low and you got these really saturated rusty orange in the sky and then the sand and it's all pretty much one tone right like the color of Arrakis and you have that moment where the Harkonnen soldiers kind of jetpack up the rock structure and yeah. they're oh, jet black and it's happening right prior to an eclipse and it's almost like foreshadowing of a of an eclipse where it's like you can see like almost like the color of like the blood moon and then like this black just kind of like whoop, going right up. Mm -hmm. That whole sequence was so beautifully done and also unsettling in the way that they just kind of like hover with like no yes. disturbance no of the sand. Yeah, right. Uh -huh. It was very mm -hmm. unsettling and a great way to open the movie. And then this actual eclipse happens so like the color tones like change immediately and it's dark and sandy and dusty and it's like you're going through this whole journey visually in like the first couple minutes of the movie and I was like that was a really well done thought out planned thing and then of course you have Jessica like hitting the guy over the head with a rock and scolding you know Paul for keeping his back turned out in the open and it it was really great there was so much going on i love that and there the eclipse what i i love the little detail that you see it you know you see the moon um coming in on one side and then it goes out the other so you see all the phases of the uh, the eclipse at different times but you mentioned Jessica hitting the rock on on the soldier you know whatever once she's um when she does that she stands up and one of my favorite shots is she stands up and she looks disheveled her hair is everywhere and behind her is the eclipse and it's like she stood up just so perfectly and you know from paul's advantage paul's point of view looking up at her and there's like an eclipse behind her and it's like you know oh there's you know, there's a metaphor there <laughs> and everything yeah which is and visually very very cool yeah yeah, I, I remember too. This is from Dune Part One, but you know, for all the uh, Arrakis rather being earth tones and rusty and you know and browns, like you said, you know this brown rocky uh, palette, um, it was contrasted by uh, Caladan, planet where Paul's from, the water planet, and I love that mm -hmm. they didn't just make Caladan like you know a um, green paradise they made it a rainy planet everything's wet everything is it's overcast there all the time but still it's very desaturated it's blue you know blues and grays and then we go to arrakis and it's warm colors still kind of desaturated um mm -hmm. you know until we get to these beautiful sunsets that you're talking about but you know yeah. I, I always like that and so each planet seemed that the only place that was really colorful was the emperor's home world um yeah you know, that had a lot of color and flowers and gardens. I thought that was, again, it, when we go there, the few times that we had scenes there in this movie, you go there and it takes you a moment, you're kind of, it's a little bit of whiplash. Like we were just in Arrakis or whatever, or yeah. Getty Prime and you know, it's harsh. And then it's like, oh, look at this, they're in a garden and they're whatever. Yeah, they did a really great job of world building via color palette and tones mm -hmm. and just, you know, set design the the emperor's little garden that they're hanging out in often 
it's just it's really it's really well done it's really beautiful i love the i love the stark the color palette and the the wardrobe of the harkonnens so much like just it, it it's just visually very cool the all black it's like very representative of the black sun and then you get to getty prime and it's like it just works so well it was it yeah. was quite like astonishing because i hadn't seen any of that in any of the trailers so i I walked in not knowing any of this black and white, well, the infrared camera thing was going to happen. So when it did, I was like, oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah, it's really cool. Thank you. I, I did the same thing. Once I saw the trailer, I mean, I knew I was sold. I knew I was going to see it like, you know, right away. And so I, I, I just, I shut out all the uh, the trailers after seeing maybe the first one or something. I did the same thing with them. Um, uh, I'm doing the same thing right now with, um, with uh, the, FX Hulu show Shogun, um, which is another one of my favorite books. I'm, I'm book. covering it right now. I love it. <laughs> oh, great. Yeah. It, I'm all over it. And uh, I'm not going to watch the, the new show until it's all done. I'm going to watch it when, when they're all out. But I'm a big fan of the book. And the same thing. So I watched the first trailer to him like, oh, my gosh, I'm so hooked. And, you know, I've actually been in instead of watching the new show, I'm waiting for it to be done, but I'm watching the old 1980s adaptation <gasps> first. And uh, there. So get it, we'll, get we'll, we'll talk about that. Yeah, come have yeah. Me on for, for that show too. <laughs> <laughs> all right. All right. Before we wrap things up, I wanted to ask what you thought the overall achievements of this movie were. And it doesn't have to be in comparison with the first one. We can talk about them as a grouping also, if you would like. You know, I think the biggest thing that these movies will do, kind of goes back to your first question. I think that this is going to reestablish Dune as a monumental science fiction story that speaks to a new generation. And... Um, and I think I, I think about my kids a lot in this regard. I mean, they're currently, you know, you know almost 19 and 16. And so, you know, I'm a kid, my 19 year old kid. <laughs> and, um, um, you know, like, sure, they've seen the book on my shelf. They haven't read it, you know, and I talk about it probably because I've talked about it since it's my favorite. They clearly stay far away from it, you know. <laughs> and, right. Um, and but when you know, my older son sat down and watched these last two Dune with me, Dune movies with me, his mind was blown. And he, and I'm like, see, like, told Told you. You. like, <laughs> like, yeah, exactly. Like, this is how I felt when I read the book, when I was, you know, about your age or whatever, you know? And, uh, and so I'm as excited for it because it finally, like, I feel like these movies really represent, like, this is how I saw the book. This is what I read and experienced in 16. So I think that these movies are going to, you know, introduce that to a, a wide range of people kind of like you know many people know lord of the rings primarily through the movies rather than the books and you know I, even if they never made those movies I, you know lord of the rings would still be popular would still be celebrated as a classic would still be beloved whatever but the movies really took it to a whole nother kind of level yeah. i think that the set of dune movies will do the same thing people will know mm -hmm you know, what Arrakis is, if you mention it. That, um, that first yeah. time that I saw the sand mouse, the Moadib in the uh -huh. first movie where the hunter seeker is like coming after him, that right. he's, you know, focusing on that. And I was like, oh, like, he, there he That's is, so there it is. Yeah. <laughs> I know. He's so, so cute. cute. Yeah. But yeah, I mean, like, it's it's interesting thinking about people who have no exposure to the book going and seeing these and it could be like a, a pop cultural reference where mm -hmm. people are understanding like oh this you know I know what that means I know this term in a way that probably wouldn't have happened without the movies but I think for me one of the strengths of these two movies are is for one it's not easy to divide a book into two parts and show them visually in a movie because typically books are written with a certain structure where you get kind of the motivation what's driving the plot forward in the beginning and then of course at the end you've got the climax so it's really hard to cut that right in the middle and make both movies be fulfilling and interesting in a way that someone wants to sit down and watch all of them and the first one felt 
a little bit more like action movie e to me where the books feel very cerebral and i kind of understand why someone would do it that way because if it's you know this very cerebral a lot of world building in that first movie it is it going to be as exciting for people who don't have that connection to the book so like i think that was an interesting choice that was made making it a little bit more adrenaline filled and very like action sequency but still also giving you these big plot beats that are from the books I think as a whole, like it really exceeded in doing something that would have been very, very difficult in terms of like separating the two parts of the two halves, I guess. And I just thought that was really impressive. And you're an author, so you probably know a little bit more about like these structural things. Well, I don't know if I know more about them. I'm a lot more. <laughs> yeah, probably. Uh, or, I, or I think about them plenty, I should say. But yeah. Um, yeah. So, you know, the book. The the book Dune is divided into three parts. Part one is Dune; they call Dune. Part two, uh, Moadib, and part three, the Prophet. And it roughly, roughly, I think, is broken up into you know, first part Dune is about Paul going to Dune and ends with him with the Harkonnen takeover. So really, the first movie, and then the second part is all of you know his um learning the ways of the fremen and you know doing everything in the northern part you know, the movie put a real heavy emphasis on the north versus south southern regions and did a great job of that and but the book yeah you kind of focus on you know him um coming to learn the ways of the fremen and learning about their culture and becoming um a rising um leader and then the third part um the prophet you know is all about um you know in the south yeah, um the the time leap and um uh, a couple of years later and taking the water of life and everything that comes from that so that that's how the book is divided up and that worked well it may when i saw the first movie and it ends with them going out in the desert i figured okay great this is cool um because the second half of the book for in my opinion is a lot i really enjoyed the second part of the book more than i enjoyed the first part of the book um i really like all the stuff in the desert all the religious stuff you know Paul's rise to, you know, power and everything else. That, that's that's where the the meat of it is um, for me. And so I knew that this movie was going to have all that stuff, and it completely delivered on that. This one they combined obviously parts two and three of the book, um, and I thought there was going to be that time leap again. Like I thought, like conveniently, hey, it's three real world years later. Why not advance the story three? years and i mean i didn't give it much thought but i just figured oh that's just what they're gonna do and i went off in my life um but i i can see why they did it because if you did it would be a big leap to be like oh by the way he married chani or something like they're you know they're <laughs> like and and in the book in the book as you know like they um he and chani have a child we're book spoilers here but yeah the um he and chani have a child that child dies, is killed by the Harkonnens, and that's the motivation for Paul to take the water of life. He says, like, I didn't have, I didn't see this happening. I didn't see our child dying. If only I had been able to see, I could have prevented this. And that was his motivation for taking the water of life. And they obviously took that away from the movie. They replaced it with the siege, the, the community of Fremen that he was a part of. Their home was destroyed. And he says, and he says <laughs> in the movie, I didn't see that coming. You know, if only I had been able to see it, I could have prevented this, or it's kind of the implication. So they replaced it, and I see why. Yeah, so I had assumed that from a structure point of view that they just would have stepped ahead those three years, and we would have got the time leap. Um, but they yeah. didn't do that. In fact, they condensed it where, you know, Jessica is still pregnant at the end of the movie rather than having a however many year old toddler maybe more than a toddler. At least in the movie, she's depicted as being like nine years old. I don't know how old she is in the. I forget how old she is in the book. Um, I don't know. You're, I'm sure your listeners. Like are, a, is it like a? Is she like two or three or something? For some well, reason, she's holding up a walk, right? She's able to walk. Yeah, her, so. I, I feel like <laughs> you know, like, but she's she's talking and stuff too. It's it's hard yeah. to like think about because she's so. It was so she's strange. so yeah. old yeah <laughs> i think the book calls out that she even still had that lisp you know that little little kids have and everything and yeah. so that common app so who knows but so but 
um, yeah. So maybe she's only a couple of years old. I don't know. Three years have passed. Jessica was roughly, you know, what, you know, a couple of months pregnant when you know they're, yeah, they got tossed out of Arakeen into the desert. So, you know, she could just be two and a half. I forget. We'll have to look it up. And I'm sure your listeners are probably like screaming at us all over their phones and telling us how old she is. Who knows? They're, but, they're uh, nice. They'll be nice. They're nice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let us know in the show comments. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, uh, but, you know, from a stretch point of view, I'm impressed at how they approach this adaptation. Now, I'm really curious to see how, if they do a Dune Part 3, which hasn't been, as of this, as of today, as far as I know, hasn't been greenlit, but I think that the director is, he has uh, mentally and emotionally committed to it. I've been reading, a, I haven't been watching the trailers, but I'm reading some interviews with him, you know, throughout this process. And it's been interesting to see how he's like, oh man, I, I, I'm i in the middle of editing. Don't even talk to me about a third part. I can't even imagine. Like, <laughs> I'm going to go do a romantic comedy next or something. You know? right, and he's just right. burned out on it, you know? And then um, it was on that Colbert uh, show that he was asked that. And I thought he was going to give a, you know, a, flip it answer but he said nope I says I, I think I could do one more and and that would wrap it up and this would be the trilogy and would be based on Dune Messiah which is the next book in the series and I and I see that because that kind of wraps up um you know the Paul story and um uh and it's really interesting because Dune Messiah did you read Dune Messiah remember I haven't okay mm-hmm. yes I won't spoil it but um nor will anyone but um but in general Dune Messiah when you read it um, it's been a long time since I read it, but it it's kind of a bunch of people sitting around in a circle talking about politics for 200 pages and then 10 pages of action. <laughs> and that's kind of the book. And, okay. um, you know, and so it's going to be really interesting to see. I'm sure that they will make it more exciting. I'm sure that they will set it up in a more interesting way and make it just as good as these first two. They'll probably have to adapt a lot more than what actually happened, I suspect, or at least the um, it won't just be talking heads conspiring and talking about the nature of what a messiah is, which is kind right, of but like, but but yeah. too, like it is interesting because like the political machinations of everything. I mean, to some people, like that's very entertaining. Oh, it, oh, it is absolutely so, like yeah, for sure. Yeah, I'm just it. it uh, it doesn't have as much spectacle on the mm-hmm. page as okay. the previous book did is kind of what I'm saying. So I see. Um, and I there, see. there are things that maybe are implied that they will probably show. Um, and there's a lot of interesting stuff with, um, uh, you know, Alia, the, um, his sister and everyone else and all the main, you know, all those characters are back. Jessica. Um, well, yeah. So yeah. won't get into it, but it'll be, I'm really curious to see <laughs> In terms of the, how they adapt this next book will be really interesting. I'm excited. I, I wanted to say thank you so much for joining and for people watching. What are you up to? Anything going on? You got some projects you're working on? Yeah, I do. Thanks for asking. Yeah. Um, so, like I, like I said at the beginning of the show, I I've been spending the last year or so, um, you know, huddled up and working on a, a new project. Um, you know, my uh, last time I was on here, I think on, on your show was um, I was releasing the third book in my Mystic trilogy, and so that's done with. That series is complete. So I'm working on a new epic fantasy. Um, this one's a standalone, and I'm pretty excited about it. Um, it's a pretty uh, beefy book. It's you know about the size of a Wheel of Time book. You know, um, okay, like 300, probably going to be around, <laughs> yeah, chunky, about three hundred thousand. At least, who knows what we'll do with it maybe the publisher will want to split it up we'll, we'll see what happens but my my intent and my goal right now is to write it as a singular novel and that's how i'm going to hand it in as one big thing and standalone you know uh, no sequels or anything like that no sequels planned or anything just just one big story and mm-hmm. um you know full of all you know um character lots of colorful and fun characters and glossaries and maps and all sorts of stuff it's been a lot of fun to write so i'm aiming to um wrap that up you know uh, this calendar year and then hand it in you know to uh um to my agent and we'll see who wants to you know do something with it i will also be i just signed up um i'm going to be at brandon's dragon steel convention ah. in december so that's in december so we're still you know, it's only march when we're recording this um so it's still a ways away, but I'll have a booth there. Um, this will be the second time that I've been there to that convention. So, and this will be, a, it's going to be an exciting year because um, uh, this is, you know, he's releasing Stormlight 5. 
Um, mm -hmm. And so I think there's going to be a, a lot of people there and um, uh, hope that if you're listening to this, you'll, you're a fan of Brandon Sanderson's and or whatever, but you know, come on by. And uh, if you happen to find yourself at the convention, I'll be there in one of the booths. Um, come and say hi. That's great. That's great. Well, I will, I will let you go. Thank you so much for being here. I'm sure we will talk again, probably, hopefully before you, you're set up at your booth and yeah, I would love maybe that. we can talk about your next book. I would love that. Yeah. We, oh, for sure. When, when, the, when that new book comes out, I would love to uh, shamelessly come on here and, and uh, talk about it with you and everything. That would be wonderful. So it's a Amber, date. <laughs> yeah. It's, a date. it's always a delight. Thank you so much for, for having me. I really, I love our conversation. So thanks me, for having me on here. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. And I will see you soon.